Thank you everyone for joining. My name is Jennifer Henderson with GT Software. Today we'll be talking about what we've seen in terms of open banking adoption and the hurdles that companies are navigating. We'll also introduce our open banking smart bridge and what that means for traditional banks and financial institutions. So today I'm joined by Dr. Alex Hublein. Alex leads the sales, solution architecture and strategic alliances teams at GT Software. Alex, thank you so much for being here. I'll go ahead and turn things over to you. Perfect, thanks Jennifer, and, and welcome everyone to uh, the webinar. I figured there are a couple of things we would do today. Um, one, give you a little bit of an intro in terms of who GT Software is. Talk a little bit about what we're seeing and what some of the analysts and experts are seeing out in the open banking world. Talk to you a little bit about a platform that we've developed to help our customers navigate and integrate with this new changing landscape. And then we can talk about a couple of success stories that we've seen throughout the years um, as we've gone through this. So let's just start with a little bit of a, an overview of GT Software. We're an industry leader in legacy systems modernization and integration. And one of the big challenges we see in open banking is most of the large banks out there have core banking systems that are mainframe based. So the question becomes, how do you go out and integrate with those systems to bring them into the broader financial ecosystem and help modernize those applications and integrate with them as well. So we spent many, many years working on technology that can do that, and SmartBridge is really the latest iteration of that technology. We thought we've got over 2,500 customers uh, worldwide, so we've spent a lot of time doing this. Um, we, we focus on doing one thing well, and that's helping our customers integrate and modernize those legacy systems. The platform I wanna talk to you today about is a no-code drag-and-drop platform that lets you create these APIs into these legacy systems to fulfill a lot of the open banking um, challenges and integration transactions. And we're able to do it literally in a matter of days rather than the weeks or months that you typically see with uh, most integration platforms or just trying to do it by hand. And you can also see some of our customers. Not only do we have customers in, in large financial services institutions, but we have a wide variety of customers in other industries as well. Now, what are we seeing in open banking? I mean, this is, a, this is a very rapidly changing landscape, but there are a few trends that we've seen thus far in the open banking world. One of the trends we've seen is that there's continued growth in things like real-time payment initiatives. So initiatives like FedNow and other real-time payment initiatives, these things are really starting to take off and we're seeing more and more banks and more and more financial institutions really get focused on the benefits of being able to implement real-time payment initiatives. The second thing we've seen is really just an exponential growth in the number of open banking API calls. So for instance, it's particularly true in Europe where we're seeing um, massive growth, you know, 15, 20% compound growth month over month in open banking API calls. We're also seeing a very similar situation in the US with open banking standards like the Financial Data Exchange or FTX. So while the volumes are still relatively small, when you look at the overall number of financial services transactions that are done every day, they're growing exponentially. So, so transactions that are adhering to these open banking standards are, are really starting to take off and the growth rate seems to continue unabated. The third thing we've seen though is that reliability, scalability and security are, are the, just the foundational cornerstones of being able to do these transactions. And what's interesting is we've seen a lot of um, seen a lot of banks out there that have that have been able to put up some relatively scalable, secure, uh, open banking APIs, but they're not particularly reliable. Or if they are particularly reliable, they run into a lot of latency problems in terms of round trip transaction times. So the, those are really table stakes. If you can't do it reliably, scalably, and securely, then you probably shouldn't be playing in this arena. And in a similar note, we're also seeing a, a huge trend towards fintechs and aggregators. Um, and, and many financial institutions are viewing these fintechs, and a lot of them are startups, a lot of them have been around for a few years. They're viewing them as both a threat and an opportunity. They're a threat in the sense that there's the potential to get disintermediated from their customers, but there's also an opportunity in the sense that they can open up 
a much wide variety of consumers to the to the goods and services that these um, financial institutions provide. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword when you look at fintechs and aggregators. But one thing we have seen is that a lot of the aggregators that are out there and some of the fintechs, you know, they started out by by really going out and screen scraping the websites of bank accounts. So so if you if you gave them your credentials to your to your bank account and many different bank accounts that you have or financial institution accounts, they could pull back all of that data. But the way they did it was literally going out and, and screen scraping the uh, login process and then pulling the data down. So not a terribly efficient way of doing things, but we've talked to customers that said, you know, 40 to 50% of all their web traffic is simply screen scrapers running from fintechs and aggregators. So there has to be a better way of doing that. And then finally, we've seen that the open banking and real-time payment landscapes, they're just changing so, so quickly. They're, they're growing as we talked about, but there's also a tremendous amount of change happening. Specifications are changing, the landscape's changing, the economics of doing it is changing, the players are changing within the industry. So there's a tremendous amount of change and that really implies the need for a lot of flexibility and adaptability. So what are the implications of those changes? Um, and, and there's a few that we've seen, and there's probably more than, than what I'll enumerate on this slide, but we've seen a few changes. One of them is that line of business executives are increasingly driving open banking innovation. When, when open banking was first put into place, um, particularly in, in a place like the UK, the government came out and mandated to the nine largest banks in the UK, they said, you all have to open up your systems. And so initially, open banking was kind of viewed as a, as a government compliance and regulatory compliance initiative. So the line of business executives weren't terribly interested into it. But what we've seen is an evolution towards them figuring out that there's actually a path to monetization when it comes to open banking. Um, there's, there's the opportunity to go out and create entirely new services for their customers. So we've seen this shift from regulatory compliance to acceptance to actually viewing it as a monetization initiative now. And so the line of business executives within the uh, financial institutions are getting much more involved and they're driving, increasingly driving that level of innovation. The second implication is that, you know, IT organizations have to be ready to securely and reliably and scalably open up these core banking systems to potentially many millions more or even tens of millions more transactions per day. So how do you do that? How do you go out there and do it in a way that's, that's going to scale well, that's going to be reliable, that's going to have a very low degree of latency? That's a very interesting challenge for a lot of these IT organizations that are used to really these systems only being opened up to, to their own internal consumers rather than being opened up to, to others as well outside their organization. So that's potentially a, a significant challenge for IT. The third implication is that you know, going out and scaling these systems and making sure that they can process these transactions in a very low latency, very high volume environment, they require a very different architecture than what I'll call traditional integration. And so that has implications in terms of the technologies and platforms that you implement to ensure that they can scale and they can do so with very low levels of latency. The fourth thing we've seen, and this is this has particularly become a problem, I think, in the last four or five years, is that legacy IT skills skill sets have been have become a big bottleneck. A lot of the people that know how these core banking systems work, that know how the integration systems with these, these mainframe applications work, a lot of them are retiring. Um, there's been a big brain drain in the industry. So these legacy IT skill sets will almost assuredly become even more of a bottleneck going forward. So the question is, how do you mitigate that? How do you rapidly evolve at the same pace that the industry is rapid, rapidly evolving at? And that's really the fifth implication is that IT organizations are going to have to adapt more quickly than ever before in order to ensure that they can keep pace with the very, very rapid changes that are happening in the industry. Now, there's just one small problem that we run into, and that's the fact that we're dealing with mainframe legacy systems. And a lot of these systems have been around for a very, very long time, and what we find is that they're very, very difficult to integrate with. So why is this mainframe integration so difficult? Why do we see so many challenges with this? Well, let's talk a little bit about that. The first challenge in integrating with mainframes is that frankly, a lot of these applications are older than I am. I mean, they were written 
sometimes 40, 50 years ago. And they've evolved over time and they're very, very reliable. They can tr process amazing transactional loads. But let's face it, they really weren't designed for the world that they live in today. So, so the hardware has evolved, but the software has evolved at a much, much slower pace. The second challenge is that when you start looking at the technical aspects of integrating with mainframes, you find a couple of things. One is that you're dealing with very complex data structures, and they're unlike a lot of the data structures that we use in what I'll call more modern platforms. And there's also a very high degree of tight coupling between applications. So there are a lot of application dependencies, there are a lot of data flows, and they're very difficult to ascertain and understand sometimes. And then finally, what we see is that there's a very heavy reliance still on what we call green screen interfaces. So these are the old 3270 type interfaces that you know, were designed for a human being to do something with. But sometimes these screens are the only way to get at certain types of information within some of these leg legacy systems. So there's still a pretty significant reliance on these green screens and integrating with those green screens can really be challenging. So let's talk about the solution uh, that we brought to market. This is what we call GT Smart Bridge. And this is built on a platform that we've had around for a long time, but we've made some enhancements to it in order to be able to work very closely with a lot of the open banking, real-time payment, et cetera, type of initiatives that are going on there. Now there's two types of integration I'd like to talk to you about today. One is what we call inbound integration. And so inbound integration is, hey, you know what? I've got a mainframe. I've got some open banking standards I need to create APIs for, and those fintechs or whomever are going to call in to my mainframe via those standards and get some information back. So this might be an account number lookup, this might be a, an account balance lookup of give me the last 30 days of someone's transaction history, et cetera. So the question is, how do you do that? So what we've built with SmartBridge is a runtime environment that basically plays translator between uh, external callers and the core banking systems that are, are running in the vast majority of the large banks out there. So this runtime environment allows these the, you to generate REST or SOAP APIs that can be accessed from outside. The runtime itself runs pretty much anywhere. Um, it can run on the mainframe, it can run off the mainframe in a Windows or Linux VM, it can run out in things like Red Hat's OpenShift environment, Docker containers, etc. But the point is, is that it's a runtime environment that takes care of all the translation back and forth between the mainframe and the external callers and enables to you to open them up via, via standardized REST and SOAP APIs. But one of the challenges that when you're, when you're dealing with mainframes and you're dealing with applications that are running on them is we talked about this idea of tight coupling. So a lot of times you might have to go to three or four different systems to get information that you and I would probably think, well, how hard could that information be to go get? So let's say I wanna go get someone's transaction history for the last 30 days. That may not all be in one system or not all the data elements that I need to comply with some of these open banking standards might be available in one system. They might be, I might have to go to three or four different systems. So to deal with those complexities within our platform, we built something called an integration workflow engine. And this integration workflow engine allows you to orchestrate those transactions between multiple systems within a single API call, package up that information, make, make complex decisions about the information that, that you're seeing, and then send that back in a format that the caller can understand. And again, complying with FTX or open banking standards or, or whatever comes tomorrow, it literally can be any type of caller. The other thing that we, we are working on right now as part of the Smart Bridge platform is building pre-built connectors to many of these API interfaces. And that's really one of the big value propositions that you'll see with Smart Bridge going forward is some pre-built connectors so you don't have to do all the wiring back and forth between these, but you'll see pre-built connectors, more and more of these come out over, over time. Now, the challenge then becomes, well, how do I go out and create these APIs? Great, there's a runtime environment, it does workflow, it does translation back and forth in different data formats, so on and so forth, sounds great. But now, how do I actually make this into something that will work? How do I define these things? So what we built is the Smart Bridge Studio. And this is a sort of traditional development environment, except that it's completely drag and drop, no code environment that allows you to go pull mainframe components that you need into a workflow, 
define what you need from those components, which data elements need to get passed back and forth, what format they need to get passed back and forth in, and then simply visually design a workflow that allows you the, the runtime environment to make decisions, to process information, to reach out to different systems, and then we're able to generate from that studio everything that's needed, all of the integration code that's needed to run in that runtime environment. And so this has a couple of implications, right? One is it's very, very easy to build these APIs. The second thing is that it doesn't require a tremendous amount of mainframe knowledge, nor does it require a tremendous amount of knowledge about modern standards like REST and SOAP and XML and JSON. We handle all, almost all of that complexity for you. So big, big game changer, instead of writing potentially thousands of lines of code, uh, integrating with these mainframes, we're able to generate all the code that's necessary to deploy into that runtime environment. And that gives you the ability not only to create these APIs very quickly, but we talked earlier about how rapidly these standards are evolving and how quickly the industry is changing. This allows you to make extremely rapid modifications to, to these workflows as the industry demands. Now, the second scenario I'd like to talk to you about is just the reverse of that. It's what we call outbound integration. And so an inbound integration, great, there's an external caller, they call in, they go through the workflow, so on and so forth, and they return a result. But what happens if I have an application running on my mainframe that needs to make a call out to the outside world, to these modern standards and to these modern systems? So for instance, I might have an application that I wrote 30 years ago, and I'd like to take advantage of a new third-party fraud detection system. How do I do that? How do I make an, a mainframe initiated call to where this older application that used to use its own internal fraud detection algorithm now wants to call out to the outside world to a, a provider for fraud detection services? How do I do that? And that's a very, very challenging thing to do from a mainframe. So we handle that scenario as well. So what we're able to do is generate very small, what look like COBOL or PL1 code blocks, really just subroutines that act as a proxy back out to the smart bridge runtime environment. And then they can call the workflows that go out and integrate with these third-party components. And this is fantastic because the COBOL or PL1 programmers, the traditional mainframe programmers, all they see this as is a subroutine that they know exactly how to deal with, they know that they're going to pass the subroutine in some information, they're going to get some information back, and they have absolutely no idea how any of this is implemented on the outside. And that's great for a couple of reasons. One is that it shields legacy developers from having to learn unfamiliar technologies, and that can take quite some time, so it really speeds time to value. The other neat thing about it, though, is that I can create these subroutines and have them call out to one fraud detection vendor and if I decide a year from now, you know what, I found a better fraud detection vendor, I'm going to switch to them. I don't have to make any changes to those applications running on my mainframe again. They still call the same subroutine. It's just simply calling a different workflow now that calls out to those uh, fraud detection vendors. So this is a very, very powerful idea. If I can do this, I can truly create outbound integration. I can go inbound or I can go outbound. And that gives me a tremendous amount of flexibility in how I deploy my com computing resources. It also gives me a tremendous amount of flexibility in terms of the types of standards and the use cases that I can support going forward. So another capability, and this is actually a real example of a workflow that we put together. This is an inbound integration scenario situation. Um, but I also wanted to mention the fact that, like I said earlier, we, we, don't, we, can't, we don't just need to integrate with existing programs, but sometimes the only way to get to these legacy systems is to go through these old green screens. So this is an example of where we took four different systems over here on the right, four different green screen based systems, created a workflow within SmartBridge for them, and then we're able to serve up that information on a standardized web page here that has different information. This is an insurance example, but if for instance, it has your, your information, your dependents, the claims history, you could, you could imagine a scenario like this in a, in a banking world, but we have very, very powerful green screen processing capabilities for those times where there may be a system that you can only get to the information you need to get through, through those green screen um, terminal sessions. 
So a lot of people ask us, well, where does where does Smart Bridge fit in? Where does it fit in into sort of the big picture? And you know, over here you've got your mainframe and your mainframe assets. You know, you've got CICS and IMS systems. You have different databases. You have different file systems. You have batch jobs, etc. And we really sit there as the bridge between those things and then a lot of other systems. So it can be we can have direct interfaces that can call out to fraud detection or anti-money laundering. We can also implement inbound calls directly from things like FDX and UK Open Banking Standards. But we also work with a lot of partner products. So we can fit in very nicely into an API management solution. So our APIs can be managed through those solutions. We can fit very nicely into an enterprise service bus because we're really just another endpoint as well as other application integration and analytics platforms. So really what you can think of us as is the best in the world at making all of those legacy resources available to the outside world and then vice versa, enabling those legacy resources to be able to make calls to modern systems in order to be able to implement functionality like we talked about. So let's talk about a couple of real world examples here. So this was a large French bank um, and their challenge was that they were they were absolutely trying to make sure that they could make these outbound calls that we talked about to do things like processing real time payments, detecting fraud, complying with know your customer guidelines. And they needed a real time solution. And what they were particularly interested in was making sure that they could go out and make calls to uh, FIS's clear to pay system from a legacy COBOL core banking application in order to do real-time payments. And so the beauty of using a technology like ours is that they were, they were actually the first bank in France to be able to implement a real-time payment um, within the country. And the interesting thing about that is that they did it without any coding and they moved from proof of concept to production in under two months. Now that would be a pretty amazing statistic in and of itself, but remember what we're dealing with here. We're re dealing with real-time payments where real money is moving around. And so that's tremendous to be able to go from proof of concept to actual production where people are using it to do real-time payments in under two months. A second example is a large Swiss bank. You may have heard of this bank before, but they needed to rapidly implement the ability to verify the status of new accounts and new customers against uh, the world check system, which really tells you, is this a known terrorist or a known criminal or whatever? And they needed to do it with a uniform set of API calls that could be called from existing PL1 programs in their core banking system. And they also wanted it to be callable from anywhere, with anywhere within the, the organization. So not just their mainframe systems, but other applications could call into these interfaces as well. So using our solution, they were actually able to develop both SOAP and REST-based versions of these interfaces without writing any code um, at both the, the integration layer and on the mainframe layer. So they were able to also, like I said, make these, these APIs available to other systems within the bank going forward. So it was a single set of callouts to these systems. They were all done in a very, very standardized way. And they were able to meet the challenge. They were able to meet the required time frame that the banking regulators had ahead of the compliance timeframe. And they did it at a cost that was literally a fraction of what it would cost using traditional methods um, of integration. So huge success there as well. So let's do a bit of a wrap up here in terms of key takeaways and next steps. I think the first takeaway that, that you, should, you should come away from this webinar with is that, look, the open banking landscape is really changing rapidly. And the time to get ahead is now. The time to get ahead isn't to, to wait until all the standards are completely worked out and, and it's all a very well-known capability. Using a technology like SmartBridge, it gives you the ability to evolve and expand in a very flexible and adaptable fashion. And that's very, very important because it lets you stay out ahead of the curve without incurring huge costs of having to go back and rebuild integrations, redo what you've done before. You can do all of that very, very quickly with SmartBridge. The second takeaway is that you know, rapid, secure, and reliable legacy integration is a, is a very, very big inhibitor to success. You wouldn't believe the number of people we talk to that say, you know, I would have had this implemented six months ago or a year ago, but the time it's taking me to go out and build these legacy system integrations, to build these calls into my core banking system is just killing me. It's killing the timelines, it's killing my ability to innovate. And um, that's a huge problem for a lot of the financial institutions that we talk to. 
And then finally, the, the third key takeaway is that if you want to maintain pace with this ever-changing landscape, you must, you have to secure, uh, choose a secure, a scalable and adaptable integration platform. And that's a key decision point. So we believe we've brought the, the right mix of security, scalability, adaptability to a single platform that will allow you to go out and fulfill the needs of your business as an IT organization going into the future. So with that, I will turn it back over to Jennifer and we'll take some questions. Thanks so much, Alex. Um, we've actually got a couple of questions from the chat room, so I'll go ahead and um, ask those to you. The first question is, you mentioned legacy skill sets is a growing problem. Can you explain exactly how the Open Banking Smart Bridge helps with the legacy skill set shortage? Yeah, absolutely, Jennifer. Um, and you're right, we're seeing a huge, um, a huge challenge in these legacy skill sets, right? Like I said earlier, a lot of the people are retiring. Um, there's been a pretty significant brain drain and trying to find people that know these technologies is not only becoming increasingly difficult, but increasingly expensive. So there's a couple of ways that we, we mitigate that. One of them is the platform, the nature of it is drag and drop, no code development. So this, this makes it so that you can have people develop these integrations that are not mainframe gurus. They don't have to be expert COBOL or PL1 programmers. They literally just have to know how to import things like copybooks or run through a wizard in order to be able to generate these APIs. And so that takes a lot of the burden off of the legacy developers that are still left. They're not having to sit around and write a bunch of code to do these things they can enable someone that's that's maybe only a little bit familiar with mainframe technology to go build APIs and then they can go check them and make sure, okay, yes, you called the right program. So it can reduce the amount of effort and the amount of labor that's required uh, on behalf of those legacy programmers. And it can also free up a lot of their time to go out and work on initiatives that are gonna drive value for the business. Okay, great, thanks. Um, the next question is, why do legacy system integrations end up taking so much longer than expected? Yeah, great question. Um, I think there's two reasons for it. One is, you know, the, these systems are mission critical. They are absolutely, I mean, they're core banking systems, right? So these run, literally run the business. And so if you look at historically the pace of change, you know, you always want to be careful when you're trying to make changes to systems that, that run your entire business. So I think part of it is cultural. I think part of it is is a, an expectation that the pace of change shouldn't be not only not only isn't but shouldn't be quite as fast because you want to make sure that all your your ducks are in a row or your eyes are dotted and t's crossed, whatever uh, analogy you want to use. So I think there's a cultural aspect to it, and then again I think there's also the aspect to it that it's just actually technically very difficult because you have people that are not used to for instance making callouts to SOAP or REST interfaces or dealing with data formats that they're unfamiliar with like JSON or XML. So I think it's a combination of culture and it's also a combination of the skill sets that are there and the technologies being involved that people tend to underestimate how long these things are going to take when in reality a tool like ours can go out and generate these things literally in a matter of hours or days rather than the, the weeks or months that we often see them take. Okay, great. Um, the third question is, Alex, do you have any examples of how a line of business executive could use the smart bridge? Yeah, absolutely. And then we see many, many different uh, use cases. Um, what, what you find with line of business executives, in, and this isn't just true in banking, this is true in many, many industries. In fact, I would argue almost all industries. Um, one area that, that line of business executives are really focused on is customer service and customer satisfaction. How do we do more for our customers? How do we create services and enable self-service, particularly in, in industries like banking, how do we enable self-service? So we see a lot of our customers using the Smart Bridge technology to create interfaces that allow their customers to do more self-service. Not only is it better for their customers, it's better for them because they don't have to get you know, traditional banking agents and, and people on the phone to do a lot of these things. They can empower their users and their customers to do a lot of things that traditionally took a lot of manual effort. So I think that's one trend that you see. The second big trend that you see is really a, a relentless drive for innovation. Um, and we're seeing that, again, not just in banking, but across many different industries. 
how can I go out and very rapidly innovate in the market? So you see executives like digital innovation uh, executives, you see people trying to implement, you know, technologies that, that we've all started to take for granted, but things like mobility, you know, mobile banking has become almost the standard uh, today. But how do you keep pace with the level of innovation that's happening out there in the marketplace? And so we see a lot of our customers using Smart Bridge uh, and the technology behind it to go out and very rapidly get to market faster with innovation initiatives faster than their competitors. And if they can do it more quickly and they can do it more flexibly and adaptably, then they can gain some sustainable competitive advantage. Um, so those are the two big categories that we see um, in terms of use cases that line of business executives are really focused on. Awesome, great. Thank you, Alex, for your time today. And thank you everyone who was able to join us. If anyone listening has any more questions or wanna know more about open banking, please reach out to us on social media or visit us at gtsoftware.com. Have a great day, bye.